Hi, welcome back. We're looking at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek, Chapter 2, Section 2.2. Today we're looking at eo verbs, or more properly they're called contract verbs. Now you've read pages 22 and 23, it's a fairly short section, but let me tell you what I reckon happened as you read that. Last time you had learned a table of first person, second person, third person, singular and plural for the verb luo. And then you looked at this and you thought, I've just learned that, that took me five days and I still keep making mistakes with it. And it was like 20, 30 minutes a day. And now you give me a whole new table to learn. Double the amount of information, I'm never gonna do this, I'm gonna give up and I've only just got into double figures. That's not what you should do. Let me tell you that although this looks like you have gotta learn a bunch of new things, you don't have to learn a whole bunch of new things because the verb phileo is almost identical to the verb luo. And rather than trying to learn a whole new set of endings, it's much better if I can explain to you what's actually going on here so that you can understand why it's slightly different. And then just understanding that rule about the difference will then help you to generate these endings from the endings of luo that you already know. Let me explain the difference. With luo, the stem of the verb ends with an upsilon, uh, a normal vowel letter, doesn't do anything strange. With phileo, the stem of the word ends with an epsilon, philet. And epsilon is quite a weak letter in Greek. So what it tends to do then, in this case, is combine with whatever comes after it and form either a long vowel or a diphthong. It doesn't like to just sit there on its own as a short vowel. Now, sometimes that doesn't make any difference because if it's followed by a long vowel like O, it's happy already. The long vowel can just stay as O, or if it's followed by a diphthong like A, then it doesn't make any difference. The A ending can, can stay there and the epsilon being weak just disappears. But when you've got just a short vowel, coming after the stem, that's when something strange is gonna happen. So for example, in the first person plural, you're used to the ending omen, like luomen, we untie. But the epsilon comes along and says, not happy with that, I like to be part of a long vowel or I like to be part of a diphthong. And so it turns the omicron into a corresponding diphthong, ooh. Let me tell you how I explain this to my kids. I say that the epsilon is weak. And like weak people, this weak letter wants to be big, wants to be strong, wants to be bigger than it really is. And so it either turns into a diphthong or it's only happy if there's already something big there that it can join in with, like the oo here, a, a, the o. The same thing happens then with the ending in the second person plural. You're used to the ending ete, as in luete, but okay, this is what I tell my kids, and maybe this will help you, it certainly helps me. Here comes the epsilon, comes along, and he's not happy because he's weak. He's not happy just being a short vowel, so he says, right, I want to be either with a long vowel or with a, dip, a part of a diphthong, and so it turns this epsilon into the corresponding diphthong epsilon iota. So philuomen, in the case of phileo, becomes philomen, and instead of luete, we have philete. But here's the rationale for this, which will help you to remember it. This epsilon, which is strictly speaking a part of the stem, is weak. And like anybody weak, it wants to be big. It's only happy if it can join in with something big that's already there, like these or if it can become a part of something new that's big, like a diphthong. Long vowels and existing diphthongs in the endings will remain unchanged, but if there's a short vowel, the epsilon will combine with it to make a diphthong. Now that should help you then to generate the table of the verb phileo from what you already know. And it's much more valuable if you understand the rules because then these rules will start to help you later on. Just a final note, Duff mentions this. When phileo is cited in a dictionary, 
the lexical form, so-called, the form that appears in a dictionary, is always the form with the epsilon there, even though it's never used. So the lexical form of luo is the first person singular present indicative active, luo. The lexical form of phileo is phileo, even though you'd never see this in writing, because this would have disappeared, being weak and displaced by that long vowel. Okay. So that's section 2.2. You've got at the end of that uh, practice uh, exercise with nine little examples to translate. What's exciting now about where you are is though you're starting to take up a few new bits and pieces, you are uh, having to learn some new things, you are already at the stage where you can write whole sentences. Because once you have a verb in Greek, the subject of the verb is built into it and you can start to write whole sentences. The way to push you along with that is just to get you to turn to the end of the chapter, chapter 29, and if you haven't started doing so already, here's what I recommend. You start learning the vocabulary at the end of chapter 2. Now while we're on the subject of vocabulary, just a quick tip on that. I recommend just little flashcards, which I've got some here. I'll show you what I do. This is a, a box. I've got these are things that my kids have made. Um, mostly, I, I've got about 10 stacks this thick of, and it's got the English on one side and the Greek on the other. And if you just make a couple of them a day, literally just make a couple of them a day and learn them as you're doing them, and then you've got a little stack which you can shove in your pocket or put in your handbag or wherever you keep things at your desk, and then you can just test yourself. Don't get to the end of the chapter and try and learn what is that 30 words all in one go. You'll just give up immediately. Do a couple a day learning ago and akuo and balo today, and then the next three, add them to your pile in the next couple of days, and then you'll qu quickly get through the vocabulary, and what you'll realize is that you can write whole sentences. I throw, we walk, they hear. And in the next session, we'll get on to thinking about how you put other nouns with those verbs, and it will get really exciting because you can start to write really quite complicated sentences very, very quickly and easily in Greek. Okay, keep working hard. 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, four or five or six days a week, not four days a week, five or six days a week. And we'll see you next time when we'll start looking at how nouns work in Greek. Okay, God bless. See you next time.